Amen. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior is in down before him for he is Lord of all sing hallelujah Christ is risen oh what a savior oh what a savior isn't he
this day gathered in your name calling out to you your glory like a fire awakening desire we burn our hearts with you you're the reason we're here you're the reason we're singing open up the heavens we want to see you open up the floodgates almighty river flowing from your heart filling every part of our Your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now, Lord, fill our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the floodgates of mighty river. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brady Witten, and it's my privilege to welcome you to worship here at First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. On behalf of our congregation, I welcome you to this time of worship. Thank you for spending your Sunday morning with us. During worship, it's our hope. It's our prayer. That you will encounter God that you'll come to know Jesus through a verse, through a song, through a story, through a prayer, through a person, through a smile. It's time to praise. It's time to pray. It's time to worship. Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Brady Witten, and I welcome you to worship here at First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I welcome those of you who are here in person and those who are joining us at home. And I do want to say congratulations, you got here on time. <laughs> and we'll find out the people who forgot around noon, right? They'll start coming in and looking, looking very puzzled. 
Uh, but as we worship today, we're going to hear about a time that Jesus was threatened and in danger, and we're going to see what we can learn by his response. Uh, and it's always my prayer that in this time of worship that you would encounter the presence of God, that you would hear a word from God for your life today, and that you would leave this time renewed in your commitment to follow Christ and to live out his command to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Let us pray. Loving God, you save all who seek refuge in your love. Grant that we who know your salvation may walk always in your light. Take courage in your faithfulness and rejoice in your astounding love for us. We ask at this time of worship that you would pour your Holy Spirit out upon us. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And I invite you now to stand as we sing our opening hymn together. And it is a privilege to welcome Meredith and Matthew Williams to our chancel area as they present their daughter, Lila, for baptism. And, uh, you know, baptism is a great reminder to us of God's love and God's grace, which I'm going to preach a little bit about uh, to you today, and I hope you'll have a renewed sense of it today. Um, but in baptism, uh, we claim God's claim upon us upon our children, and it is our prayer that Lila would come one day to know that love and grace for herself, uh, to live a Christian life, and, and to profess her faith openly. But for this time, we claim that faith and, and that love for her. So I have some questions to ask, ask you on behalf of God and on behalf of the church. So first of all, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sins, do you? And do you accept the freedom and the power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they might present themselves to you? And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, and do you put your whole trust in his grace? And do you promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which he has opened to all people? And will you nurture this child, Lila, in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching... By your example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. Okay. And uh, 
baptism is partly an initiation into the body of Christ, and so you all have a part to play in this as well, and it's also an opportunity for you to renew some commitments. And so do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? And will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include this family now before you in your care? What name is given this child? Lila Jane. Lila Jane, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, let's go see everybody. Lord God, we thank you for Lila. We thank you for the gift of her life. And we thank you for this time of her baptism where we claim your claim upon her. And Lord, it is our prayer that she would come to know you, to know your love, your grace, to know Jesus, and to say yes to him in her life. And so, Lord, at this time of her baptism, we ask that you pour your Holy Spirit out upon her. Lord, guide her in the way that leads to life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, there you go. All right, congrats. And in our shared life together as we celebrate this beautiful baptism of this child, child of God, we also turn our attention and our focus to these beautiful roses that are located here on the podium, given in honor of the birth of Mitchell Calvin, child of Kate and Ryan Verisco, born December 27, 2021, Miller Phillips, child of Margaret and Michael Perniche, born February 23, 2022, and Charlie John, child of Kristen and Paul Rushing, born March 7, 2022. And this votive candle is in loving memory of Jane Ann Ankinson. So now let us center ourselves as we open our hearts to God and go to prayer. God of compassion, you come to us in the darkness of our unknowing to comfort, to heal, to restore. You weep with us in our weeping. Your tears wash our eyes to show us how we can love and serve others and the whole world. Your wisdom whispers softly in our hearts. You are mine, both now and forevermore. Be not afraid. But we must grieve that which we must grieve. And in our suffering, let us not forget the infinite possibilities that are born of faith 
by grace alone. This day, may we find contentment knowing that we are children of the living God. And therefore, we are deeply known and loved by the one who created and creates all things beautiful and new in their time. May this truth settle into our bones. May the Spirit of Christ instill within our spirits a peace and an understanding that is beyond compare. May we always remember to pass on the love that has been given to us and bless others in joyous anticipation of the new creation. Lord of true light and a tender heart, may we always use our gifts and talents to your glory and in service to others and all creation as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And as we stand together to sing hymn 108, the children are invited to come down during the last verse of this hymn for our children's service with Miss Joy. And those of you who may be watching us from home, please gather around and join us in this time of prayer and conversation.
I'm Miss Joy, and I am so glad to see you guys this morning. Yesterday, I got to tell you what I did. I went down to New Orleans to see my niece. So my little sister, Shirley, has a little girl, but she's all grown up now, and she even has a baby herself. And when she was born, my sister called me and told me what her name was. And I thought, hmm, that's kind of odd. I, I'm, I'm not lying to you that I've never heard that name before, and I thought it was a little strange. And I said, Shirley, tell me why you named your baby that name. I want to hear, you know, your, how you thought about that. And she said, I named her after my husband, her, her daddy, my niece's daddy. And he's a really, really good man. Well, fast forward a few years, and my little niece was at school. She was little. She was probably about y'all's age, something like that. And one of her friends said to her, your mama must not love you because she named you that. You should see these eyes. I wish you could see their eyes. They're like, oh, they knew that was bad, right? We, that's a mean thing to say, right? What are her friends? Can you imagine? We don't want friends like that, do we? But let me tell you what she said. Let me... Let me tell you what my niece said. She said, my mama does love me because I'm special. Now, there's all kinds of things that my niece could have said, right? She could have said, hmm, your mama doesn't love you. But she didn't. So what I did was I brought some paper down here today, and I wanted to show you what this looks like from kind of a paper kind of perspective, because I love paper. I love to make things out of paper. And she could have said, huh, your mama doesn't love you. Your mama doesn't love you. Right? What else could she have said that would have been mean? Yeah. I'm not going to be your friend anymore. Crumple that paper up. What else could she have said? You are rude. You are rude. Yeah, what else? You are mean, absolutely. Oh, crumple it up better than that. We got to get a ball. Get a ball. Crumple that thing up. Yeah, one more. What could she have said? You're not very nice. That's exactly right. Oh, okay, one more. You're horrible. You're horrible. You're, you're horrible. Okay, okay, one more. I'm a sucker. You're terrible. Okay, now everybody that took one of these papers... I want you to straighten it out. Yes, yeah, squish it up. I want you to straighten it out. Here you go. Straighten it out. Make it really flat. Make it, make it flat. You can put it on the floor. Make it flat. Make it flat. Okay, so, so what? Oh, you can't make it flat, can you? Yeah. Does it look like this anymore? It doesn't look like that anymore because once, the, once you've said those words and they're out of your mouth, it's permanent. You get all kind of wrinkles in your life, you know? So what I want you to do this next week is when somebody's... It's too late. That's right. It's too late. So this week... Uh oh, yeah, you could rip it. So one thing that I want you guys to remember this week when you're going to the playground and you're talking to your friends, if somebody says something mean to you, think about that paper. Once I say something mean back, I can't take it back. Can y'all do that for me? Yeah? Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please help me to be careful with the words that I say. Please help me not to be mean, even if somebody is mean to me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, let's go. Y'all can take your paper. Thank you, Miss Joy. Uh, as the children return to their seats, I want to invite you all to stand and to share the peace of Christ with one another. And those of you who are at home, if you'll extend that peace in the comments or however you want to do that today.
So I hope that you always uh, take a little bit of time while you're, while you're in worship or maybe when you go home to look through the bulletin. Uh, this not only helps us through the worship service, but also kind of serves as a bit of a newsletter and has all kinds of different activities happening in the life of the church. I hope you're, you're informing yourself about those things and participating in those things where you can. Uh, I want to lift just a couple of things to your attention, and as I do, I want to invite you to find the blue attendance pads that are at the end of each pew. If you can pass that down your row. Uh, for those of you who are at home, you'll find links to the different things I'm going to talk about on, uh, in the comments of whichever platform you are worshiping on. Um, but the, uh, I want to draw your attention to something called a Connect card there, and that's just a way you can let us know that you are in worship. Uh, you'll also find prayer request cards in the pews. If you have a prayer request, those can go in the offering plate. You can always bring them forward and share them with me at the end of the service. Uh, and we will be taking up an offering. And for those of you who are at home, you can always mail a gift to the church. You can go to our church's website, and you'll see a text-to-give option as well. With those things said, I'll invite our ushers to come forward as we take up our offering, and I invite you to bow your heads with me in prayer. Gracious God, you pour out blessing upon blessing, and you cover us with your grace. We ask that you would accept these offerings, that they may bring those blessings and grace upon those who need them, and give witness to your overwhelming love. Bless these offerings and all the good that they do, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
and join me in the prayer for illumination for Lent, printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, fasted 40 days in the wilderness and was tempted as we are, yet was without sin, send your Spirit to strengthen us through your Holy Word. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's reading is from the Gospel of Luke. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me again until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. <laughs> so I do want to take just a moment, uh, for those of you who are my friends on social media, you know that uh, my brother Butch, who's three years older than me, had open heart surgery a week Friday, a week ago Friday, and I was able to fly up this weekend, or this week and spend a little time with him. So I wanted to say, first of all, thank you for giving me the time to do that. Um, he's doing well, sleeping a whole lot, uh, but uh, he's, he's doing well. And I also want to encourage you, if you have something like that happen, if, you're, if your people have something like that, Stop what you're doing and go be with them. Uh, it's important. Those moments are important, but thank you for that. So an amazing thing happens here in the 13th chapter of, of Luke, and I'm, I'm always struck, no matter how many times I read these stories, something new kind of jumps out at me, and something really grabbed me this time that I haven't noticed before. And it's something that reveals something profound about Jesus' heart and character. Uh, it's something that is very good news for you and me. And I want to share that good news with you. Uh, and it's something I also believe gives us a roadmap uh, for navigating the difficult times in which we find ourselves living. So it's good news, uh, and it helps us to it kind of gives us a roadmap for navigating these, these difficult years we're living through. We are, we are living through some difficult times, right? Okay, so here's what's happening Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Um, and really, in this whole season of Lent, we are journeying with Jesus towards Jerusalem. We're journeying towards the events of Holy Week, where Jesus will have this final confrontation with the spiritual leaders in Jerusalem and the temporal leaders. He'll be turned over to the Romans. He will be crucified. Uh, he will be laid in a tomb. But then we know the rest of the story, right? On the third day, he, he rises again. And, and, and all of those things are kind of referenced in this passage from Luke 13. But in Luke 13, 22, just before this reading, it says this, Jesus went through one town and village after another, teaching as he made his way towards Jerusalem. So Jesus is purposefully heading towards this city where he is going to have this final confrontation with these rulers and authorities, and he knows it is going to end in his death. And some Pharisees approach him. Now, here's an interesting part of this. These are, these are some Pharisees that seem to be on Jesus' side. You know, often the Pharisees are kind of seem like they're out to get Jesus. Well, these guys are warning him, and they tell him, look, King Herod wants to kill you. Get out of here. Anybody want to guess where King Herod lives? In Jerusalem. And Jesus is heading like right into the fox's den, so to speak, right? And these guys are going, look, get out of here. But Jesus tells them, no, look, this is what has to happen. I got to do what I got to do. Uh, and then Jesus uh, makes it even clearer that Jerusalem is going to be the city where he's going to die when he says this, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, 
the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Again, he knows what's going to happen. Now, knowing this about Jerusalem, uh, other than running the other way, which is what I would do, uh, what would you expect Jesus' attitude to be towards this city and towards her people? What would you think his attitude would be? What attitude do you have when people are trying to hurt you and get you and, and, and cause you harm? What attitude do you have towards those people? So uh, for the past few weeks, we have all watched in horror as the Russian invasion of the Ukraine has unfolded. Um, it was bad enough to me when Putin crossed the border in the first place. To me, he was already wrong. But when the Russians started bombing civilian areas. And most recently we've seen uh, that, that there was a hospital with women, who were, a maternity hospital that got bombed. And I got to tell you, when I saw those things, it not only broke my heart, it made me mad, right? And I'm, I'll tell you what, I'm a pretty tender-hearted person. I am a pacifist at heart. I really am. I just wish, I'm like, why can't we all just get along? Why can't we live in peace? Y'all, y'all with me on that, right? I, I mean, that's kind of where my heart is. I know that may not be reality, But anyway, so when I saw this, it makes me mad. Does it make you all mad? And i got to tell you, there's a part of me that says, let's go get him. And again, I know it's not that easy. So I have this part of myself. When people are hurting others or harming others, especially if they're going to hurt or harm me, uh, I know how I want to respond. And if I was Jesus, and I was looking over Jerusalem, and I was looking over those people, knowing the things that I know, knowing that they're going to turn me over to the authorities, knowing they're going to turn me over to the Romans, knowing I'm going to be tortured, knowing I'm going to be killed, I'd want to rain down a little fire from heaven on Jerusalem, to tell you the truth. But you know what's amazing? That is not what Jesus does. In fact, this is what he says. Listen to this again. So he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children together like a hen gathers her brood under her wings. And you know what I want to say? What? Now, uh, there are many ways that we can picture Jesus, and there are many ways that we can imagine who God is. The, The Bible fills us with these great images. We can picture a shepherd with a staff in hand looking out over his flock, We can picture a father running towards his prodigal son. We can picture a lion, a gate, a bridegroom, a servant. Well, now you can add another one to your list. A mother hen caring for her chicks. This is the image Jesus gives us, and it is a beautiful image. It is a tender-hearted image. It is a compassionate image. A mother hen. This This is Jesus whose wings are held wide open, ready to receive and to protect her children from whatever harms them, ready to shelter them as best she knows how. Now, there are all kinds of things I think we can take away from this incident, this moment. Uh, I want to lift up just two. The first thing I think we can learn from this, and really I think we're supposed to learn this from all Scripture, is it tells us something about the character and nature of God. Who is God? What is this God like? So I got to attend a few LSU football uh, games this last season. Uh, It was right about the time where they were saying, hey, if you're vaccinated, you can come to the stadium. And and, uh, I love going to LSU games, love taking my boys. Zoe's not really interested. If she wanted to go, I'd take her. (laughs) But the boys and I go. Um, And I love to watch LSU football. But you know what I really love to do? People watch. That's like my favorite sport. And there's no better place to people watch than LSU Tiger Stadium, especially since they started selling alcohol. (laughs) Now, we could talk about, well, that's a whole other conversation. I watched a man who was so inebriated, he could not, he was kind of stumbled his way to his seat, and I thought, I felt bad for the guy. I watched a couple, like, they were having like a full-on, like, ugly couple argument in Tiger Stadium, and I watched them, and I sort of thought, maybe I should go give them a business card. (laughs) Now, I saw other people just having a good time and cheering on their team and enjoying the fellowship of the whole thing. But I found myself thinking, and maybe it was because, maybe it's the open air thing, but when I sit there, I find myself thinking, I wonder what God thinks looking down on all this. I wonder what God thinks. You ever think those kinds of things? 
uh, or is that a preacher thing? You know, it really does. Like, what does God think? So interesting tidbit, uh, it is believed when Jesus makes this speech about Jerusalem that he is standing on the Mount of Olives. Uh, the, the picture that Lamar put on the front of the bulletin is actually a picture from a church on the Mount of Olives. So it's believed that Jesus is sort of looking over Jerusalem. And modern scholars believe the population of Jerusalem was about 100,000 people. Well, guess how many people fit in Tiger Stadium? 102 and something, right? But, you know, similar-sized crowd. And so you can kind of picture Jesus looking over Jerusalem. My question of sort of like, what does God think when he looks down on these people? Well, i got to tell you that I believe that Jesus gives us an answer in this Scripture. What does God think when he looks down over humanity in our brokenness? What does God see when he looks down over humanity? What does he feel? What does he think when he looks down over us in our struggles? What does God think when he looks over us and sees our mistakes and our wayward ways and all this? What does God think? Well, you know what Jesus tells us? He longs to gather us under his wings like a mother hen protects and loves her children. And I got to tell you, to me, that is an amazing, amazing thing. See, one of the fundamental claims of the Christian faith is that Jesus is God. I don't think we can overemphasize that. I don't think we can say that too much. In the person of Jesus Christ, we believe the God who is the creator of the universe took on flesh and walked among us. And what did God experience with people? He loved us, and he healed us, and he extended compassion to us, and he extended mercy to us. And do you see what good news that is? I think so many of us have this idea. We kind of wonder, who is God? What is God like? Well, Jesus answers these questions for us. Uh, God is a God of love, a God of compassion. God is not a God who who came to to get us or to judge us or to condemn us or to punish us. Uh, Really, in some ways, this compassion of God is the foundation of the entire gospel. And some of you, most of you, many of you will know this scripture from John 3, 16, right? For God so what? Loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the reason Jesus came, because God loves us. So when God looks at humanity, God's first emotion is not anger, it's not condemnation, it's not this desire to punish us. What Jesus says is when God looks at us, God's desire is to gather us up Again, like a loving mother hen gathers her chicks. But listen, there is one thing about this scripture I think we need to pay close attention to, and it's this. God might love us, but God cannot make us accept that love. So did you catch what Jesus said? He says, How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. And you were not willing. So it's God's desire to gather us up under God's love and grace. Who's the one with the problem? It's us. It's us. So interesting thing about a mother hen. Uh, When a mother hen is trying to protect her chicks, she will not run around the, the hen house trying to, like, get the chicks to come together. You know what she does? She parks herself. And she waits for those chicks to come to her. Now, listen, there are other images in the Scripture where God does go out and find the lost coin and the lost sheep and the lost... So they're there. But in this image, we have a a, a mother hen who sits still, and she waits for the children to come and seek refuge under her wings. Uh, Jesus can do all kinds of things, but he will not legislate love or control your will. So this leads me to to something else that I think we need to think about. Have you come to Jesus seeking refuge? Have you come and put yourself under the love and the compassion and the tenderheartedness of God? Uh, I would say this. Have you said yes to Jesus' love? Have you said yes to being a disciple of Jesus? And are you following kind of where that yes leads? Because it leads someplace, right? I really do believe that if if you say an earnest and honest yes to Jesus, Jesus is going to help you figure out where to go from there. Have you done that? Have you done that? Are you living that yes out in your day-to-day life? Uh, And what fruit is that yes bearing in your life? Do Do you see 
Do you see yourself changing? Do you see yourself becoming more like Jesus? So that brings me to the second thing that I think we can learn from this passage. So the New Testament makes it clear that what we have received from God, we are to extend to others. It's over and over and over again in Jesus' teachings. Just as God has been compassionate and tenderhearted towards us, we are to be compassionate and tenderhearted towards others. Paul says it this way in Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. So this is the roadmap part I was telling you about. We've talked about the good news. Now where do we go from here? So I am convinced that the primary reason, the primary reason that people hurt others is because they themselves are hurt or afraid. I'm convinced of that. Do you want to know how I know that? Because it's been true in my life. Uh, There was a time where I was angry, and I was hurting, and I was lost. And guess how I treated other people? Not very well. Not very well. Uh, I was having a conversation with my stepmother years ago, and and I was finally at a point in my life where I was no longer defensive about that time in my life. And she said to me, man, you were hard on your mom and dad. And I just thought about it, and I said, you know what? I'm sorry. And I meant it. I was not fully myself. Again, I was hurt, and I was just hurting others. So years ago, a spiritual mentor asked me a question that's always stuck with me. It's sort of a little scenario. And he started by asking me, he says, have you ever had a dog that you loved? Y'all ever had a dog that you really loved? Sorry, cat people. I think this could apply to cats, too. I have a cat. I like my cat. But this is a dog story. Okay. So if you have this dog that you love, can you imagine your, your dog in your backyard, maybe in a field near your house or something, and it caught its foot in a trap? And you went over to the dog that you loved, and you were trying to help your dog, and your dog is hurt, and your dog is what? Afraid. And you reach out to try to help the dog, and the dog bites you. Do you get mad at your dog? Do you get angry at your dog? No, you might pull your hand back. It might, I mean, it hurts, right? But do you get angry? Are, are, you, are you mad at your dog? Why not? Because the dog is hurt and the dog's afraid, and you know that the dog is acting out of that place. Now, listen, don't put your hand back out there to get it bit again. But, but the emotion is completely different, right? When you recognize this is this animal that I love who's hurt and afraid. And I'm telling you that when human beings hurt one another, that's where it comes from. It comes from that hurt and from that fear. That's the primary place. Um, And if we can remember that when we're being hurt, I'm going to tell you, it is liberating. It's liberating. It's not about you. It's not about you. Uh, Can you think of someone who has hurt you? Can you? Can you see where at that time they were also hurting? Uh, Can you find a bit of compassion for that person? Uh, Again, if you can, you're liberated from it. Uh, And I can also tell you that that tender-hearted posture opens up the possibility for change and healing to take place. So Proverbs 15.1 says this, A soft word turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And I can tell you whether it's in my life as a pastor, or whether it's in my life as a parent, when I can respond from a place of tenderheartedness and compassion, parents, you with me? Spouses, you with me? When I can respond from that place, things go so much better. <laughs> they just go so much better, right? Now listen, I do want to offer two caveats here. First, I'm not saying that you should stand by and allow someone to hurt you or abuse you. Uh, sometimes healthy boundaries are the most loving thing we can do for that person and for ourselves. Like I said with the dog, don't stick your hand back out there and get bit again. That's just foolish, right? But it's about your heart. Uh, We have to guard our hearts. In a world that is often very hard-hearted, right? We are the ones who have to make sure as Christ followers that we don't allow our hearts to become like that. We're supposed to be different, difference makers in the world. And the second thing is this. Uh, 
being compassionate and tender-hearted does not mean that we don't act in the face of harm and injustice. Uh, we can act, we must act. One of the questions we asked in baptism, in this baptism, right? Uh, will you use the freedom and the power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in every form that it presents itself? And we say what? Yes, I will. I'm not going to sit idly by, right? Uh, but when we act in, as Christians in the world, we are to act in love and compassion and tenderheartedness. So here's a question for you. I started out by talking about the Russian invasion of the Ukraine and how it makes me mad, and it does. What is a loving Christian response? What do you all think? And I'm going to tell you this. I do not have an easy answer to that question. A lot of really smart Christian people have thought about this for a long time. How do we as Christians respond in these situations? So I can give you a couple of thoughts. First of all, we can pray. We can pray for the Ukrainian people. We can pray for their safety. We can pray for their strength. Uh, some have suggested we could pray for Vladimir Putin, that he would have a change of heart, that he would have kind of an Emmaus moment where his eyes were open to the, the com compassion, right? So when I think about praying for Putin, it reminds me of an old Irish prayer I heard one time. It goes like this. May those who love us, love us. And those that don't love us, may God turn their hearts. And if he doesn't turn their hearts, may he turn their ankles so that we'll know them by their limping. <laughs> I told you it makes me angry. Anyway, so we can pray. Uh, we can also give money to support humanitarian aid in Ukraine. So the United Methodist Committee on Relief is taking up an, an offering. I know UNICEF is involved in the area. Uh, it's the age of Google. Go home and Google something, but do something, right? As, as people of compassion, we're to act in these situations of break, brokenness and hurt. Um, I think we can encourage our government representatives to take action, and I know that might look different depending on the way we see things, but we can call them and say, hey, look, we care about the situation, and we want to know that we're doing everything that we can. But above all, we must guard our hearts. You hear me? We're supposed to be like Jesus was towards Jerusalem. In a world that is often very hard-hearted, our job is to make sure that doesn't happen to us. So what is a loving Christian response to the hurt in the world? Jesus shows us it is self-giving and self-sacrificing love. That's what it is. So many of you will remember the shooting at the Sandy Hook School in Newtown, Connecticut, back in 2012. And in the midst of the horror that happened there, there were also these stories of amazing beauty that emerged. Isn't that amazing how that happens? In the midst of these horrible situations, we see the human spirit just shine. So there were some teachers, uh, many of them survived, who draped their bodies over the little bodies of their students when that gunman entered the school. And there was one teacher in particular, her name was Vicki Soto. Uh, and Vicki's friends remembered her as a person who loved to teach children. They spoke of her enthusiasm for life. They said what a good friend she was. And how she loved, even as an adult, to watch the movie The Little Mermaid. But when that gunman entered her classroom, she took all of her children and she put them into a closet and she stood between them and the gunman, and she got shot, and she died at 27 years of age. So here's what we have to understand. Jesus tells us that's what God is like. That is good news for you and me, right? But then Jesus also calls you and me in receiving that love to go out and to love in that way in the world, right? Jesus calls you and me to take shelter under his wings and to join him in the mission of bringing the kingdom of God on earth, a kingdom of tenderheartedness, compassion, and love. So go out there and get to it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So it's always a privilege 
for me to be able to invite anyone here uh, who is looking for a church home, a church family to be a part of, to consider making First United Methodist Church that church home. Uh, we believe as Methodists that the Christian life is best lived out, I might even go as far as to say only lived out in the context of community. We need one another. Uh, and so if you're looking for a church community to be a part of, I'd love for you to make First Methodist Church your church home. We have a gathering called Believe and Belong, and you'll find some more information in your bulletin about that. And I'd love, love to have you if you're ready to take that step. Other thing I want to make sure you know is we do have a resource table. So it's just through that door to my left. I guess that's your right and to the left, your right. Um, and on that table, there are some basic resources about Christian teaching, some basics about the Bible, and also some basics about the Methodist movement. And we invite you to take any of those if you're interested and want to learn more. And I invite you now to stand as we sing our closing hymn. As you go, may you take shelter under God's wings of compassion and tenderheartedness. And in a world that is so often hard-hearted, make sure that yours is not. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.